So the commanding officer of this carrier, USS Wasp, throws out wood chips from his high perch overlooking Gemini 9 and the uh, recovery mission in the area that we're in right now. And uh, when those chips hit the water, he can tell their relation to the, to the ship as to whether we are actually moving it. That's what chip stays right in his line of vision, directly below where it hits. The job is done. The frogmen are waving at us now. They are that close. So the astronauts, you can see, uh, Don, the hatch is open. The astronauts waving. One frogman has just jumped off the collar very, of the spacecraft. There now, we can see uh, the head of uh, Stafford, who waves one hand, then clenches both hands and waves them. Uh, Cernan, too. As uh, we look at it from here, Stafford, the command pilot, is on the right. Cernan on the left. Behind him, standing on the collar, one of the swings. Now they both wave. Stafford gives a thumbs up. Big smile. That is a most, most welcome sight and a couple looks, of happy fellows right now. Looks very relaxed. Both look very relaxed. Uh, you get a good view there now, too, Bill, of the uh, reentry attitude control section, the small open end of the spacecraft. And the moment that uh, Gemini 9 hits the water or any spacecraft, there is a can in there of dye, which uh, has like a vegetable material top, which dissolves instantly. The, the instant that uh, craft hit the water in that position, you know, Don, it's remarkable now, looking at uh, Cernan, the pilot of Gemini 9, sitting there, uh, leaning back a bit on the open hatch on his side. It almost looks like a man sitting in the back seat of a convertible on a Saturday afternoon somewhere. I have uh, long since given up trying to really realize what a fantastic thing we are eyewitness to. The whole thing is practically beyond comprehension. Where they have been, what they have done, and the almost tame manner in which we see them now. And now, the uh, Don, the hatches have been closed. I see that. All three swimmers are getting back in the water, I think, or at least on the collar. Uh, this is now as we prepare to uh, affix the lines to Gemini 9 and uh, lift her out of the water, bring her up to this number three elevator of the WASP, and bring her on board. And uh, it'll be right here a few feet from where we're standing that uh, Stafford and Cernan will set foot on United States soil. If you are willing to accept the premise that they do not take United States soil with them when they go aloft in Gemini 9. But the uh, line is about to be fired. Bill, a question for you, sir. Uh, the dates of Gemini 10, I was just wondering in, co in uh, connection with uh, Captain Hartley being relieved of command of the Wasp. There goes the uh, Gemini 9 out of the Atlantic recovery. up Gemini to the uh, deck of the now, aircraft carrier. Up. Slow Let's rejoin sure. Don O'Neill and Bill Ryan. Just, above. Clear just the above the level of the elevator. And it is a rather, uh, well, shall we say, weather-beaten looking, Bill? How's well, it looking? Well, it you? would be with all the heat it has been subject to. It's uh, understandable it would have that mottled look. The water continues to pour from it. Approximately a ton of water is uh, around and within that spacecraft uh, when it's first lifted from the surface, but that pours off and we're left with oh, around 4,000, 4,500 pounds. Bill, it remains to be seen in just a moment who just gave the signal, but uh, to Chick Stucka of McDonnell Aircraft, I just saw a thumbs up from inside the now spacecraft. Now they're moving to break the collar loose. They're breaking straps and the collar is coming loose. The elevator of, uh, je of uh, the WASP right now, elevator three, is becoming covered with green dye. Actually, seawater, which is still pouring out. And because the, of the fact that Gemini 9 is slightly tilted forward, not much, but slightly tilted forward, you've got this pouring out, and it's still coming out at this moment. Now it is facing the small end in toward the hangar deck of uh, the carrier WASP. Sailors are quickly pulling the flotation collar into the ship, inboard, off of the elevator, and Gemini 9 will be settled down into its carriage, the dolly as we have called it, with the business end, the re-entry control section end, facing us, and almost directly pointing at the red carpet, 
upon which St Stafford and Cernan will be walking in just a few minutes from now. That loud report you just heard, Don, incidentally, was the flotation collar as it was pulled away from the area where the spacecraft is being put down. It hit something, and it now is leaking its air. Oh, boy. Thank you. Thank you for the report. And uh, also, I might add that uh, steps, small stairways in brilliant yellow and white with the WASP emblem emblazoned on the sides have uh, just been hurriedly pulled out so that when these hatch doors open, as they will momentarily, the McDonnell and NASA people will be at the top of the steps. Chick Stucke is going up there with... The wrenches are going in place now. Here come the hatches open. Put down, it hit something, and it now is leaking its air. Oh, boy. Thank you. Thank you for the report. And uh, also, I might add that uh, steps, small stairways in brilliant yellow and white with the WASP emblem emblazoned on the sides, have uh, just been hurriedly pulled out so that when these hatch doors open, as they will momentarily, the McDonnell and NASA people will be at the top of the steps. Chick Stucke is going up there with... The wrenches are going in place now. Here come the hatches open. There's Tom Stafford. And here they come. Tom Stafford... And Eugene Cernan. ...to pop his head out, recognizable by uh, a noticeable lack of hair on the top. Slightly balding Tom Stafford and a very, very happy Eugene Cernan. Cernan. They're speaking, Don, with John Stonecipher, who is the team leader here, the NASA recovery team leader. Again, Stafford clasps both hands, gives a thumbs up. He and Cernan shake hands. Now Stafford walks down one set of stairs. This is the farthest Stonecipher. these men have been away and uh, from each other in four days. Without anyone at the moment. Now they'll be Maybe. walking past us in just a moment. Being greeted by the skipper. Stafford waving up to the bridge. Tom Stafford there on the left. Eugene Cernan, who made that two-hour spacewalk yesterday on the right. We'll talk to you all about it. Tom Stafford, the first man to do two flights in the Gemini. Here they come, shaking hands, saying hello, and uh, there's a slight beard growth on Tom Stafford, but Gene Cernan doesn't look like someone who's been away from his razor for three days. See Cernan's uh, special astronaut pants there, made of metal, metal, iron pants they're called, special metal uh, to protect him against the blast of the rockets he never got a chance to use that would have maneuvered him in space. Go down into the island of the uh, Wasp. Be going below to sick bay for immediate medical debriefing, medical tests. Because we could quite clearly see there didn't seem to be anything wrong with Tom Stafford okay, and Eugene Cernan. Stafford and Cernan have cleared the red carpet past the Marine Color Guard with the flags of the United States Marines. Now, taking a look in the Gemini 9 capsule, we can see doors wide open and all equipment being checked out at this moment by McDonald people. We're looking around the forward and uh, bell end of Gemini 9. And there is something which has to be done here which is vitally important, and that is to make sure that the rocket ejection seats, which have the capability of ejecting these astronauts at a very, very high altitude during re-entry, about 40,000 feet, these seats have to be checked to make sure they are in, not in any condition where they could possibly be triggered hello, off. Hello, truck. They would send quite a rocket blast out. And the last thing... The, uh, very, very forward end... The last thing that those uh, astronauts do before leaving the spacecraft is to disarm the, uh, the various uh, pyrotechnics still aboard, about which Don O'Neill and Bill Ryan were telling you. Uh, as a matter of fact, the very last thing they do is to turn off the lights. Oddly enough, 
just as if you were leaving on vacation or leaving home, they, uh, that's the last uh, move. Turn off the electric power, the lights in the uh, spacecraft. When they do that, uh, the pyrotechnics presumably cannot uh, fire again. However, they are further disarmed by the technicians who are just about to climb aboard the spacecraft, as you saw there. And so it was a 72-hour and 14-minute flight. It was uh, beset by trouble from the very beginning, from the very concept of the flight, actually, uh, because on February 28th, the prime pilots who were supposed to have made this flight, uh, C and Bassett, uh, were killed in a trainer plane crash as they were coming into the McDonald plant in St. Louis. And uh, Stafford and Cernan, as their backup men, were put into the flight instead. They've had their troubles uh, getting aloft, as you know. Back on May 17th, they were supposed to go. There was difficulty then when the Atlas failed to put the Agena into orbit. And then they were supposed to go on May 31st, a one-day delay, uh, because uh, the Atlas uh, wasn't quite ready for that flight. Uh, it finally got off uh, three days later after another delay because of some trouble with a little one-inch square transistor in the ground control system. Uh, when they got aloft, they found that the shroud had not dropped from the target to vehicle and they could not carry out docking as they had hoped. They had trouble with a fogging visor of Cernan's uh, the, and some communications problems with his maneuvering unit that caused them uh, to have to uh, terminate uh, the spacewalk a little bit early and not do all they'd planned. But they came back uh, certainly to glory, coming down within a mile and a half, and that did turn out to be official finally from Paul Haney II of the aircraft carrier Wasp for a successful recovery and uh, another American flight in space. Our next space report at approximately 3.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, live coverage when astronaut Stafford and Cernan reappear on the Wasp to inspect their spacecraft. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News Space Center in New York. Hundreds of members of the crew of the carrier Wasp gathered here on the hangar deck for a ceremony honoring the astronauts, Lieutenant Colonel Thomas P. Stafford, Lieutenant Commander Eugene Cernan, and also giving the astronauts an opportunity to honor the crew of this carrier for the recovery made earlier today in the Western Atlantic, a recovery that went off without a hitch, a recovery that uh, featured uh, one of the most wonderful sights in uh, space and naval history, that of the spacecraft riding down directly in front of the carrier on a big orange parachute, floating slowly down through a light cloud cover and haze, and uh, floating to a reasonably gentle landing on the waters of the Western Atlantic, and a recovery that came about very quickly. I can see now coming down the ladder from the uh, captain's cabin, the chief master at arms, Kenneth Everett, astronaut Stafford, followed by astronaut Cernan, Captain Gordon Hartley, a member of the NASA recovery team, its leader, John Stonecipher, the ship's executive officer, Commander J.B. Schaefer has just called all those here on the hangar deck to attention, and here the party is coming to the stand. Admiral William Leonard, commander of the recovery forces in the Western Atlantic, Lieutenant Colonel Stafford, Lieutenant Commander Cernan shaking hands with Commander Schaefer, Captain Hartley, Captain J.C. Berriman, who is uh, Chief of Staff on the Admiral Staff, John Stone Cipher of NASA, and also on the platform are two Sailors of the Month, one and a Seaman of the Month.